Foreclosure activity increases, but we're still kind of in this holding pattern with respect to that part of the marketplace. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Today is the 16th of March, halfway through the month, I guess you could say. Um, hope everyone's doing well. And you know what? I mean, we're, we're in the spring break. There's spring break down here in Florida. Uh, a lot of people are coming down. It was a busy weekend where I was. And um, a lot of people, you know, coming to the state. So that's what's happening these days down in this location. But first of all, if you're not already a subscriber, if you could please help my channel grow, smash the subscribe button. I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And this video today is brought to you by our partners at foreclosure.com. To take a look at foreclosure.com, go to gethousingdata.com. And basically, you can see, um, you know, active foreclosure and other distressed property listings right in your own backyard. Foreclosure.com is the nation's leading provider of this type of information, distressed property listings. Check them out. And the reason why I check it out, because we talk about that all day here. And by the way, you can get a seven-day free trial, under $40 per month to get the service. Go to gethousingdata.com. Check out the foreclosure data in your neck of the woods. All right. So we are talking about foreclosures today. That's why that, you know, little commercial there was apropos. Um, U.S. foreclosure activity sees an uptick in February, but still down significantly from last year. So the whole point, though, is that, you know, we, yeah, we're seeing some movement and movement being that it's greater than what was in January. All right. However, it's still significantly down from last year. And why is it down from last year? Because we are in basically a foreclosure sale, eviction moratorium, um, forbearance, the whole bit. So a lot of properties that should be moving through the foreclosure system, regardless of what state or location you're in, are not doing that right now. They're not doing so because lenders are going, well, we have moratoriums. There's no, no, no I guess, purpose or, or doesn't make sense to process the stuff if we can't take it to sale anyway. So people are getting a little bit of a, a relief here as far as extra time on their property for various reasons. And we'll talk about that in a second. But basically, it's significantly down from last year because, yes, you know, we're in a holding pattern. Nothing's happening. And also, the courts aren't pushing stuff through. And I can tell you, even some lenders who I guess you could say whose clients don't fall under any forbearance type of protection, um, some lenders just aren't pushing the foreclosure actions because they figure going, you know what, the you know the, the court systems are slowed down, the judges, the court administrators, they're not actually working in the government buildings, they're they're doing everything via Zoom or you know from their house, whatever. So it's kind of like let's just let things ride out until we see some more opening up and things are changing, which you know I guess makes sense in the long run. Uh, but so every so often we see spikes in foreclosure rates. So the highest foreclosure rates in February were basically in Utah, Delaware, and Florida. So states with the highest foreclosure rates, uh, Utah, Delaware, Florida, Illinois, and Louisiana. And we, when we talk foreclosure rate, it's, you know, one per housing unit. So the words, you know, like from this case, you know, I guess you could say Utah had one in every 3,883 housing units. So comparatively speaking, they had the highest rate among some of the bigger metros across the country. Um, other locations, Provo, Utah, Shreveport, Louisiana, Lake Havasu, Arizona, Cleveland, Ohio, Florence, South Carolina. So basically it's, you know, locations they look at statistics. That was the group, you know, of 200,000 people or, or above. Metros with a population greater than 1 million. Cleveland, Ohio, Jacksonville, Florida, Riverside, California, Birmingham, Alabama, St. Louis, Missouri. So clearly, you know, we're going to start seeing some of these larger cities start, you know, increasing in their foreclosure rates. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, most of it's pretty much the same. So foreclosure starts increase monthly in 29 states nationwide. So what they're saying is the government's moratorium bans foreclosures on government-backed loans for homeowners and borrowers in the forbearance program are also protected from these foreclosure actions. But loans on commercial properties, investor properties, and properties that are vacant and abandoned that always have the same protections. This could be why we're seeing a slight increase in foreclosure starts despite the government programs. All right. So states that had at least 100 foreclosure starts in February um, that saw the greatest monthly increase in foreclosure starts were Utah, North Carolina, Michigan, Georgia, Mississippi. Um, going to counties, uh, we had L.A. County, Utah County, Cook County, Illinois, uh, Harris County, Texas foreclosure starts, Riverside County, California foreclosure starts. So what, what foreclosure starts mean is the fact that the lender has started the foreclosure process, whether that's in a judicial state, which they typically file what's called a notice of Liz pendens, 
I always joke in going, you know, the first time I ever experienced foreclosures, you know, it's like, what's Liz Pendens? Well, Liz Pendens is Latin for, I guess, notice of litigation. Liz Pendens is not a lady who works at the local government uh, courthouse or office, okay? Liz Pendens, right? So anyway, and if you're in a trustee state, you're going to have what's called a notice of default where the lender tells you you've defaulted the terms and conditions of your loan, so we're putting you on notice. And then the next phase is a notice of sale. So these are what's called foreclosure starts. So yeah, what they're saying here is that, you know, Homes that maybe are, are in properties that don't fall into these moratoriums are starting to squeak through now and increase because from a lender perspective, if the, foreclo if the foreclosure is vacant, why do we need to hold on to it and wait? Let's process it and get it moving, which I do agree with. It seems to make sense. And you'll find some lenders who, whose clients who are in the foreclosure process that don't fall under any protection, they'll start theirs as well too. All right, so just looking at some of the top U.S. counties with the highest foreclosure rates, so Cuyahoga County, Ohio, Philadelphia County, Pennsylvania, Hillsborough County, Florida, that's where I'm at, Riverside County, uh, California, Miami-Dade, Florida, San Bernardino, California, Broward, Florida, Cook County, Illinois, Orange County, Florida, Los Angeles County, California. So when I take a look at these um, counties, these pretty much were the same counties during the last housing boom, bust, crash crisis that had the significant amount of foreclosure uh, properties as well too. So it's kind of like I'm seeing the repetition, history repeating itself right now. So things are starting to pick up. It'll all come in due time. So uh, foreclosure completion numbers increased 8% from last month. So lenders repossessed about 1,545 U.S. properties. We're calling them REOs, now real estate owned, up 8% from last month, but down 85% from the last year. So, you know, it's one of those things that, um, you know, same thing, that we're going to see some increases month to month, and that should happen. But when you compare to last year prior to COVID, so if you think about it, February was really the last month where we did not have a uh, any sort of moratorium or, or stoppage in court filings, evictions, whatever, foreclosures due to the COVID pandemic. So February is kind of our last month. And I guess now once we start doing March, April, May, now the numbers are going to change because things were not moving last year. So we'll see how that plays out. So again, just something to think about. And again, your, your numbers, again, are the greatest number of REOs were in Chicago, St. Louis, New York, Atlanta, L.A., which is not surprising. Now, when you take a look at, you know, 111 REOs, 54 REOs, 36 REOs, that's nothing. That's virtually no REOs were, were being completed in those cities. But at least I can tell you that when you take a look at Chicago, St. Louis, New York, Atlanta, and L.A., there's no surprise that they're going to be leading because they're the population base, the number of foreclosures that go on in those locations. So and everything is starting to make sense again. Um, you know, a couple of weeks before this, the, the, the February foreclosure report from Adam, they put out their vacant uh, zombie properties, vacant property and zombie property um, for the quarter, I believe. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, vacant zombie properties remain minuscule factor in U.S. housing market amid ongoing foreclosure moratorium. So once again, I don't want people out there to think, oh, life is good. The market's great because there's no foreclosures happening. And there's no zombie foreclosure. So as they're stating here going, it's due to the pandemic, due to, you know, the, the I guess you could say the moratoria, due to. Uh, court system slowing down due to judges not processing, due to lenders not processing. So this is that calm before the storm. Uh, this is that sort of, you know, almost like, hey, look over here. Everything is great. Don't look over there uh, where we're going to have problems in the future. So please realize that this is nothing like what's going to happen the next little while. So ultimately, in the end, they're looking at, you know, a vacant zombie foreclosure uh, report. Um, you can see that it's the first quarter 2021 show that there's 1.4 million uh, vacant residential properties representing 1.5% of all homes. So what this sort of means is that there's vacant properties. Now, not every vacant property in this report means that it's a distressed property. You could have a vacant property because uh, you so choose to keep it vacant uh, for other reasons. Maybe, you know, it's an inherited property, you haven't dealt with it yet. That's a property going through the probate process. It's a second home, so you're not there right now and they did their information. Maybe um, you've, you're a landlord, so you're not going, you have a vacant house, you're not going to rent it until some of this pandemic stuff's over and we can get stimulus payments and you know your tenants are going to pay. So there's a number of reasons why, why properties are vacant. Now, as a subsection of vacant properties, there is the zombie foreclosure. So that's sort of what you know we're looking at here is that you know the zombie foreclosures are kind of the ones 
um, that are moving through the system right now. And what they're basically saying here is zombie foreclosures down in 35 states. Well, that tends to make sense. And the reason why it makes sense is, is because I guess you could say if no new foreclosures are coming on the marketplace or REOs, then you know you're taking a an inventory base and depleting it every month and not adding to it, right? So that's why you know down in 35 states. So um, a total of 6,700, 6,677 residential properties facing possible foreclosures have been vacated by their owners nationwide in the first quarter of 2021 down from 7,600 in the fourth quarter of last year. So that's a, a, de a decrease. Um, um, the number dropped quarter over quarter in 35 states. So we're looking at the biggest decreases from last quarter uh, from zombie properties are Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, Connecticut, and California. States with the biggest increases include Arkansas, Texas, Minnesota, Massachusetts, and Missouri. So it's kind of like some states, you know, uh, they're slowing down and they're going away. Some they're increasing again. Just depends on state location. A lot of it has to do with, as I said, the structure of how foreclosure process works in any given state. Now, zombie foreclosure rates rise in 29 states. So uh, the rates increased in the fourth quarter of 2020 to 2021 in 29 states. Those with at least 100 properties in the foreclosure process during the first quarter that have the largest increases include Kansas, uh, Arkansas, Minnesota, Maine, Hawaii. Um, the highest numbers of zombie properties. Uh, again, in northeastern and Midwest states. So you take a look at, um, you know, New York continues to have the highest number of physical properties in the first quarter. Over 2,000 followed by Florida, followed by Illinois, Ohio, New Jersey, and California. So when I look at those numbers, guess what? That's consummate with the last housing crisis. So yeah, New York has a ton of pre-foreclosure homes. Uh, so does Florida, so does Illinois and New Jersey as well too. California will have a fair amount just because of its sheer volume uh, of population and homes in that location. Uh, but when you take a look at New York, Florida, Illinois, Ohio, and New Jersey, they're the state, they're what's called a judicial state, so their foreclosure process tends to, you know, the way that's set up tends to lend the fact that we have a longer time frame to foreclose, more notice, and there's longer, so there's longer overall time frame, which means there's more zombie foreclosures. But, um, so that's just some information to keep in mind. So if you're in those locations, yeah, that's an opportunity. Other high-level findings that we have here uh, from that report. Well, let's take a look at that. Um, see the uh, metro areas. Um, the highest zombie rates in the first quarter are Peoria, Illinois, South Bend, Indiana, Cleveland, and Baltimore that had 100,000 residential properties. Aside from Cleveland and Baltimore, highest zombie foreclosure rates in metro areas, at least 500 residential, 500,000 residential properties. Um, you have St. Louis, Missouri, Indianapolis, Ohio, Virginia Beach, Virginia. So we're getting some, you know, we're seeing St. Louis again, but we got Indiana, Indianapolis and Virginia Beach. The lowest zombie foreclosure rates in metros with half a million properties were San Francisco, uh, Denver, Charlotte, and, and Los Angeles, uh, and, and New York, New York, um, which is interesting how that kind of works out. Um, highest level vacant investor home homes in the first quarter, Indiana, Kansas, Mississippi, Ohio, and Michigan. That's investor-owned homes. They don't have to necessarily be foreclosures. Uh, highest vacancy overall rates for all residential properties are in Oklahoma, Tennessee, Kansas, Michigan. Lowest are New Hampshire, Delaware, Vermont, and New Jersey. So there you go. Um, so again, we're back and forth. Just depends on your location, structure. Highest zombie foreclosure rates in Mount counties with at least 500 properties in foreclosure during the first quarter of 2021 were Cuyahoga County, um, uh, Broome County in New York, um, Pinellas County, Clearwater, which is next to me, uh, Onondaga County in Syri you know, Syracuse, New York, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania area. So that's kind of the situation here. So um, it depends on the availability. Lowest rates among those, um, Passaic County, New Jersey, New um, Queens County, New York, Westchester County, New York, um, Osceola County, which is Kissimmee, Florida, and Kings County, Brooklyn, New York. So it's almost like it, it can vary county by county, which probably uh, boils down to demographic of housing structure, you know, well, what's going on there, uh, probably demographic of income in that location, uh, and, you know, vacancy or vacancy rates, demographic of what's going with respect to um, purchase price, things like that. So there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, whether you got more zombies or vacancies or less zombies or vacancies. But in the end, it boils down to, you know, we're starting, you know, the, the, I guess the net result is, hey, we're starting to see some increases in foreclosure activity, which would tend to make sense now as more states open up and will tend to make a lot more sense eventually as some of the forbearance 
um, you know, we'll say, um, I guess your forbearance requirements and time frames uh, cease to exist and some of the moratoriums uh, will be removed as well too. So that will be happening this year. So just hold tight, it will happen, guys. Um, this just was the you know, top 10 zip codes of the greatest increases in vacant properties uh, in 2021. And the vacant properties, as I said, don't have to be just foreclosures. You've got uh, Bristol, Connecticut zip code, uh, Ventura, California, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, San Francisco, California, uh, Greeley, Colorado, Germantown, Maryland, Fort Worth, Texas, Jackson, New Jersey, San Antonio, Texas, uh, looks like uh, Vizelia, California. So these are specific zip codes that saw a pretty big increase in vacant properties. So, you know, w w again, whether they're all foreclosures or zombies or just people, you know, going back and forth and stuff, you know, has been left uh, vacant, you know, who's, who's, you know, no one's quite too sure, but that's just, you know, certain, you know, you might want to look at those zip codes and say, well, there, is there certain reasons why we've seen an increase in vacant properties? You know, who, who knows? So there's always underlying economic reason uh, when we have these problems. But as I said, in summary, slowly foreclosures will be making their way out into the marketplace here. With respect to volume, I mean, we're going to see a lot more that will happen in the wild. And I always say, when will this ride end? This market can't be sustained. And yes, it cannot be sustained. There's more problems underneath uh, the scene. Um, you know, Black Knight puts out their information. We haven't got the update for February yet, but you know, they're, they're saying their total properties that are delinquent are 3.3 million. That's Black Knight's exposure, I guess, level right there. Um, I know it's not an accurate number. We get conflicting statistics. The actual number is much bigger with respect to different you know, pieces of information that we get. I can share with you that I spoke to a gentleman who is a pretty uh, darn good investor in the state of Illinois. And he's also, and he probably is watching the video now, which I appreciate. Uh, he also uh, is involved, um, I would assume, some sort of ownership and, and um, production in um, the foreclosure data. So he's right in the thick of things and he sees behind the scenes as well. And we were speaking the other week and same thing. He's looking at these forbearance numbers and these delinquent numbers. And he's going, they're not matching up to what is really happening. When you actually take a look at the behind the scenes number, the stuff that we see is all, you know, extrapolation, summaries. You know, it's not the real numbers and stuff's not being counted. And just, I guess you could say, you know, the, you know, people can, in statistics, you can make a lot of assumptions, right? So that's a narrative that we're being given to make sure we all feel well. And then the secondary narrative is the fact that, oh, everything's gonna be good because of all the equity that we have, people are gonna sell their homes and life will be good. So we're not gonna see any foreclosure prices, any mortgage crisis, any cash out refi crisis for all sorts of reasons. Oh, tighter lending standards a whole bit. Well, you know what? Um, if we had tighter lending standards, then people would have more money and possibly be able to not, you know, like ride up some of this wave. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can look at this, but you know, I'm not knocking people who, who take who need for forbearance and things like that. If you need it, you take it. It's, it's given to you. Take advantage of it. But but we just realize that you know, it's at some point in time that solution ends, and you gotta you gotta deal with the the problem with the property. Unfortunately, all right. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, again, this is the article. I'll just I just keep showing, repeating stuff. You know, um, forbearance can erode equity. I don't think that's factored in when when a lot of the news reports and narrative talk about trillions in equity. They take a look at the equity today, and they take a look at the loan the loan balance or, or probably the loan um, that you know maybe loan balance when the loan was was secured and put into play but they're not adding in that middle part which is the forbearance amount that'll change things dramatically uh, just the way it goes and, and I'm pretty sure that's how they're, they're, they're recounting the numbers we all know that short sales and pre foreclosures are poised to become more dominant share distress market in 2021 and beyond if you're not looking at this now you should why? Because one percent of all on-market property sales fall into the distressed property category. Those are REO sales and short sales. No one is doing this. How do we know this? Back to the one percent rule. If people were doing more of this and, and jumping on this game right now, that one percent would be five percent, ten percent, whatever. Um, it's not. It's less than one percent across the board. How, I, how do I know this? Because right there, look at that red arrow. This is the most recent information that was, uh, you know, that was put out by uh, National Association of Realtors. Distressed sales are one percent of all the existing sales across the board. There's your proof right there. Okay, um, foreclosure fines are quietly increasing. More properties are scheduled for auction, but we're still thinking the one percent rule. That's the opportunities, guys, right there. So, what is the next opportunity? Well, I can tell you that expect more distressed properties. They will be coming. It's just taking time, but things are changing. We can see it out there. We know that behind the scenes. The data is building. It's like you know a geyser volcano. Just the pressure's building. It's going to have to happen. 
owners will need to sell at some point in time once the forbearance and some of the stuff plays out. That's going to cause some chaos. And you know, again, it's, it's what I look at is going time versus dollars. You know, if, if you need to sell, if you've got time to list your property and wait for buyers and closings, that's great. But a lot of owners who will be under their, on the foreclosure path won't have the time to do that. So the quicker they can sell, the faster they can get out of the problem without losing it to foreclosure. So time equals discounts. We will take it. We will also see investors who will want to liquidate. We see that right now. Some investors going to the top of the market. I want to liquidate now. We have investors that maybe go. You know what? Um, uh, I'm going to. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm going to sort of you know get rid of the the, the bottom 15 percent or 10 percent of my portfolio. Sell those off. Amass some cash so I can buy some buy some next stuff in the future. So you get rid of your your least performing assets and and to buy better ones. We are seeing an uptick in foreclosure auctions that will happen. We will see an uptick in foreclosure filings that will happen. And as a result, we'll probably see more short sales listed. But there's more to that, which I'll talk about in future videos, because people don't know what to do and don't know where they're going to go. So they tend to stay in their property and do nothing, which causes them problems down the road. But eventually, we will see an increase in REO as more things go to auction. Uh, and stuff sort of works through the system. More will be available than predicted. We are not seeing the true numbers. Every time I talk to somebody who, who understands the data or has access to data, we see it's a different ball game than what's going on. That's what we're being told. And I can tell you right now that, uh, and first of all, could there be any more housing uh, videos out there? I mean, my goodness, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing out there from people who just put a video up and they're getting tons of views because that's they're talking about things that you want to hear. Oh, will there be a housing crash? Don't expect a housing crash. Where are prices going to be? I can tell you that this is all basic real estate agent stuff. A lot of these real estate agents do not get into the data. They don't have access to the data and they don't look for the data. And they just talk about, as I said, oh, you know, the government's going to step in. We're, you know, people are going to be okay. There's going to be equity. Oh, there's going to be support. Oh, you know, uh, we have better lending, st lending standards these days. So all these people that, you know, it's not like the last housing crisis. I can tell you what we didn't have in the last housing crisis is job loss. Okay. What we had in the last housing crisis was messed up mortgages and people taking out cash out refis. What we have now is job loss and income issues, uh, which will affect more people down the road and that will cause more of a problem than we have now. And as I, as I said, you know, I'm getting confirmation from a lot of different sources. There's way more stuff happening behind the scenes and problems than we're being told from the mainstream media perspective narrative. So please keep that in mind, all right? More will be available and predicted. We're not seeing the true numbers. I'll reiterate that once again. So having said that, uh, sorry, what do you need to do? You want to get involved here. I got a new program out. You might want to take a look at that. Beside my short sale, I got something called Zombie Foreclosure Flip. I'm just launching it right now. So get in right now. A better price, lots of benefits, much more interesting for you guys. And here's an example. So this is you know, most recent data in my Metro MSA. You can take a look at the lack of inventory, less than one month of, of inventory on single family homes in this four county region of Tampa Bay. So a million five people here, lots of people, lots of stuff going on, but you know, less than one month's worth of inventory. When you take a look at the numbers, so take a look at, this is the median prices for traditional closings, $285,000. Foreclosure REOs, median price of sales was 180,000. Short sales was 194.5. So when you take a look at the discount is there and the equity is there. And that's not even trying hard to push those prices down if you have the right system to do what I do with respect to the short sales and the REOs. So, so that's the scoop here, guys. So there is opportunity here. You need to contact me to figure this stuff out and get involved, whether it's learning it or doing it, whatever. Drop me a line, send me an email. I'll make sure to get back to you, put in your contact information so we can talk. All right, guys. So it said connect with me at my email right there. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the views, likes, comments. A lot of stuff on the go. It's going to get worse before it gets better. We're going to see some adjustments. And now, now, and as I said, now that I've spoken to other people in different parts of the country that seem to have a lot of intel and intellect, Behind the scenes, I'm very confident about what's going to happen. And we'll say that certain minds understand where things are going to go. And, you know, we're preparing for it right now. Be prepared. Get involved in the game. Understand where the market's going to head. Look forward to speaking with you soon. Take care.